Yeah, so before uh, Eros introduces me, since I'm uh, nearly the last speaker, I wanted to say to the uh, academic organizers as well, this has been an absolutely superb school. Uh, I can't remember when I've uh, you know, learned so much in such a stimulating environment at a school before, so uh, I think we all owe them a definite vote of thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, just checking the real time. Uh, I, so, I changed my title just slightly from the one that I put in the program. I thought that in this second uh, lecture, I would give you a talk a little bit more biased towards materials because we've heard about a range of things at the meeting, but we haven't really had a talk concentrating on materials. And there's a second reason that is worth it because it makes it worth it, I think, to, to do this. So in the first lecture, I mentioned that uh, beyond the gallium arsenide uh, uh, or SI MOSFET 2 DEGs, there were um, three new candidate systems which had attracted attention in hydrodynamics and maybe more broadly. So uh, actually just uh, yesterday morning, I thought, well, I wonder if we could come up with some quantitative measure of how much attention they'd attracted. So I typed graphene into Web of Science. How many papers, uh, so a hit here is a paper that has graphene in the title or abstract. How many hits came up? <laughs> All of them, yeah. Somebody's pretty good, 170,916. So, yeah. so then I typed while. Yeah, that, yeah you know, uh, yeah. In the, in the, so Zach Fisk is, um, Zach, Zach Fisk is, uh, does the job of one of the editors at PNAS and he once told me that the biggest uh, surprise he gets while doing that is, is how people manage to stay awake long enough to write some of the papers he receives. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> while, how many, roughly? Including group theory. Including, that's just while, that's just what I did. 15,000. Delafossites. <laughs> 1,000, <laughs> right? And of those delafossites, I happen to know because I'll show you in a minute, I wrote a review about them a couple of years ago. Delafossite metals less than fewer than 100 papers, right? And so uh, somebody has to tell somebody what delafossites mean, I think. Or, uh. <laughs> but then you might wonder, why has this happened? I mean, obviously, there's some social nonlinearity. But you might say, have they been discovered recently? No. It's because they're boring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve. You're going to see in a moment that we think the same way. So, damn it, he spoils my joke. Anyway, recent discovery, no, they were actually discovered and single crystals were grown and basically characterized at least at room temperature in 1971. Are they hard to make? No. Uh, they crystallized them in DuPont in 1971, left a recipe in the literature. The other groups have adapted them somewhat, but at least for palladium cobaltate there was enough information there to grow them quite straightforwardly. And here's the Kivelson reason, <laughs> that we have to examine all possibilities. <laughs> uh, and you, you know, that's going to be for you guys to judge by the end of the talk. Um, so uh, in spite of that quite dramatic indifference of the community to these materials, I did find some friends to play with. And uh, they're listed there in alphabetical order. I'm going to try and reference the people piece of work by piece of work. So some of them are in the audience. So what I'll try and tell you about then is uh, because they genuinely are so little known, I'll tell you about their crystal structure and their electronic structure and uh, mention just how high the conductivity is and why that's attention catching. Then I'll do the first small digression into hydrodynamics where I'll tell you about the hydrodynamic flow experiment that we attempted about four years ago now and why we attempted it. One of the questions that that begged was, is the mean free path really as long as the conductivity implied? Can you really just do a completely brainless, I shouldn't say that to my uh, materials collaborators, can you do a very simple uh, growth and no post refinement at all and get a layered material coming out of your furnace, which is three components uh, that has a mean free path of tens of microns? That's what the conductivity tells you, but you have to treat that with some skepticism. But uh, there have been posters at the conference reporting on ballistic transport studies that we've now done that really say that that seems really to be true. The next question then is why could that be? 
And actually, in my opinion, as a kind of uh, materials interested physicist, the answer to that is in some senses the most interesting and significant of all. So I would encourage you to stay awake if you can until that point of the talk. And then I thought that since it's a hydrodynamic uh, workshop, I would return to hydrodynamic issues, discuss briefly the attempts we've been doing to do magnetohydrodynamic measurements, why the, they are hard to understand, were hard to understand, and now I think really quite a significant reason why they're possible to understand, but one that we should all be bearing in mind when we're thinking of flow experiments in general on electron systems. So what are these things? They are triangular lattice layered metals, at least the, met the metals. There are many semiconductors and insulators among them. And the ones that we're going to be interested in have the general formula ABO2, and they consist of triangular coordinated layers of either platinum or palladium, separated by transition metal oxygen octahedra, where the octahedra have an unusual orientation compared to the cuprates, where you would talk about apical oxygens and these things are sitting on uh, this way. These are octahedra lying on their side and edge sharing. And that has chemical implications for the existence of the materials. It has some very interesting physics implications, which I'll touch on only extremely briefly during the talk. So the electronic structure beginning, if you want to begin in kind of inappropriate, but maybe informative ionic terms, Platinum or palladium sit in the 1 plus valence, which is an extremely unusual valence chemically for those elements to be in. I think it may even be the only known platinum 1 plus uh, material, I'm not sure. That means that in the case of palladium illustrated here, you're in the 4D9 configuration. Uh, in the case of platinum, you're in the 5D9 configuration. But it's undoubtedly true that the 5S or 6S levels play a decent role in determining some of the properties. In the transition metal, uh, valence counting tells you your transition metal has to be 3 plus. And if it's cobalt or actually rhodium, then it's going to be uh, in the 3D or 4D6 configuration, low spin. So the cobaltates that I'll be talking about for hydrodynamics exclusively during the talk are all non-magnetic conducting metals because the cobalt is non-magnetic. In many ways, a more interesting situation is when you put chromium, so palladium chromate is a growable crystal. When you have chromium, chromium in the 3 plus valence is 3D3, and that means that, but the chromium layers are definitely insulating, and that means they're not insulating, and there's now very solid theoretical and experimental evidence that that's the case. And that gives you a really interesting situation where you have quasi free electrons in a natural heterostructure with MUT insulators, and spectroscopically, there's some, I think, very interesting cross-coupling that we are now beginning to understand. And that, that, that you know, that's, it's a new area of the condo lattice phase diagram that can be explored by, by thinking of that kind of spectroscopy. But that's not something I can really talk about. I'll just mention it during the talk today. So if you're interested in some of the spectroscopic stuff was not done when I wrote that review article, but the review article at least uh, gives you access to the 60 or 70 papers on these things that existed up until uh, uh, about uh, spring of 2017. And you're yeah. that mobile electrons with the metallic layers coupled to spin in the Yeah, the yeah. Uh, implicitly, it's coupled to the MUT insulator, yeah, but I mean, that's, again, I'd be happy, would be delighted to talk to, with people about that afterwards, because I really think it's interesting. Um, but I can't, I don't have time to talk about it in the talk. So, uh, then, what catches, what could have caught everybody's attention and should have done in the 1970s but didn't is the amazing room temperature conductivity of these materials. So here's an attempt to take what could have just been a boring table and make it into a graph. So that then always uh, uh, begs the question, what's the x-axis? Luckily, I have sharp graduate students, so Philip and McGuinness the other day said time, right? And so, yes, indeed, we are dealing with uh, thermodynamic equilibrium compounds here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so here, is the, uh, here are the room temperature resistivities of the alkali metal series of elemental platinum or palladium and of a couple of the oxides that were famous as being sort of super high conductivity oxides. There's a cluster of materials down here which are the most conducting that we know at room temperature and they are the usual elements but amazingly part one you have the delafossites in there with resistivities just at room temperature, which are comparable to those elements. Amazing part two is amazinger and amazinger, 
because the carrier concentration, volume carrier concentration, is about one third as big in the delophosites because of the spacer layers. So in terms of relaxation time or mean free pass at room temperature, uh, when you're thinking of a proper metal with something, these are monovalent metals, when you think of proper metals, these are the longest mean free pass that we know to exist at room temperature. And uh, yeah, again, it's kind of incredible. Most of that could have been worked out on the basis of these chemistry papers from the 1970s, and somehow nobody paid any attention to it. You know, you do, it does beg the question, why on earth or how on earth does a three component oxide end up uh, somewhere there in the phase diagram of known materials? So uh, the, from the 70s, things kind of lingered. Not much work was done. There was some work done in, the, in Tokyo on these materials in the 90s. And I actually remember going to a conference uh, about 97, 98, in, in, uh, in, I think in, in Nara, and seeing a poster about this. And I even wrote to a couple of collaborators and said, that might be quite interesting to work on, but we didn't take it anywhere. The guy who did take it up properly was Yoshi Maino, and uh, you know, he's the single person I've published uh, co-authored most papers with in my career. Very good friend of mine. He always seems to have a nose for working in the right place. What he did then was to grow, they grew single crystals, and they showed what hadn't been showed before, that you could achieve a very high resistance ratio. So they also measured the resistive anisotropy, which is at least a factor of 1,000. It's a couple of thousand, actually, at low temperatures. But he showed that there was a very high resistance ratio achievable of, uh, in the fa of factors of hundreds. And that meant, after a little bit of uh, uh, joint work where we sorted out the numbers properly, that the uh, resistivity at low temperatures is only a few nano-ohm centimeters. Right? And that's an unbelievably low resistivity for a material to get. I mean, and so uh, it corresponds to a mean free path of tens of microns. If you like mobility and you're a gallium arsenide person, that's mobility in the millions at gallium arsenide densities. Right? And, so that's, and, and you haven't even tried. Right? And that's the really surprising thing. So once I saw Yoshi, once Yoshi told me about this, and of course what Yoshi was interested in doing was finding superconductivity in the chromate. Because they're very, a superconductivity group, and he, his intuition said that the coupling or the existence of magnetism in the chromium oxide layers might lead you to find superconductivity, which so far has not uh, proved to be true. So his group did a little bit of it on it. Hiroshi Takatsu was a graduate student of Yoshi's, and once he moved off to another group, they wound down their effort. But we thought, OK, we want to work on this. We're quite interested in collaborating on this. And then I became even more interested in collaborating on it because uh, the group, uh, a, a group from Korea, H.J. Noen collaborators, did photo emission experiments which established the facts I'm showing here. These facts are being shown on the basis of our own collaborations data. And the thing is, in these excellent lectures that uh, Dima Pezin gave earlier in the conference, he correctly pointed out that the Fermi surfaces that, you're, that most metals inflict upon you make interpret, well, he didn't quite put it that way, but my point of view, they make interpreting anything you measure extremely difficult because they uh, introduce complexity that you really don't want. These things not only have this astonishing conductivity, they're fantastically simple. They're monovalent metals. They have a hexagonal cross-section, cylindrical, almost perfectly two-dimensional Fermi surface. So, uh, you know, if you want the time is it, so it's a bit like having a, a layered but facet, Fermi surface faceted alkali metal to work with. And it's monovalent, so the Fermi vector is different to what you're used to in semiconductors. The Fermi wavelength, of course, is different to what you're used to in semiconductors. So you're not in the same, you're not in a comparable region of parameter space that you've been in with any ultra-high purity material before. What about the Fermi velocity? The Fermi velocity, uh, uh, yeah, incredibly, this is the other thing that amazed me, and we're only just beginning to half understand this. The Fermi velocity is 90% of the free electron velocity on that surface, on that face. So, you then have this very unusual situation. In my simple-minded thinking, that is definitely a d-electron Fermi surface. It's that shape because it knows about the periodic potential. But the Fermi velocity is the Fermi velocity of an s-electron Fermi surface. And essentially, you can see that in the band structure once you look carefully enough. The, although you're not occupying strictly an s-band, you're occupying a band which is a hybridization of an s and a d-band, and it kind of picks up the d-band topography, 
but the S-band type Fermi velocity. I mean, I'm telling you the facts of the band structure calculation. I'm still, do we properly understand that? I, I say I don't. The, the masses, the masses we can measure, we did. Uh, started out by doing extensive de Haas van Alphen studies of these things, and their masses are of order one, one to one and a half. Yeah. Other questions? And that's, I mean, when I say one to one and a half, that's not experimental uncertainty, that's between the different materials. Yeah. So, really, very simple uh, place, which is always nice for a simple minded man like myself. Now here I just wanted to mention that uh, we set out to do photo emission to establish the bulk Fermi surface because we wanted to know what that would be like for the kind of transport measurements we wanted to do. What we were completely unaware of at that time was that the surface uh, and well that there is while the bulk states of platinum and palladium cobaltate are non-magnetic and magnetism is not relevant to the rest of the talk. There's plenty of interesting magnetism to find in these systems and uh, including incredibly large Rashberg split surface states on palladium and platinum and uh, cobalt and cobaltate and palladium rhodate. Uh, for, that's for one surface termination. For a different surface termination, you get surface ferromagnetism. And then when you go into the uh, chromate, you get this spectroscopic signal. Actually, that entire faint shadow uh, Q-shifted band is a spectral feature which is due to a condo cross-coupling between the two layers. And so it's giving you information about the spin susceptibility in a MUT insulator from a very high resolution, entirely unspin resolved spectroscopy, which is not something that we ever imagined would be possible. I should also say that uh, 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 this is a collaboration with Phil King's group in Scotland in a different country. And the reason it's worked is that this young woman, Veronica Sunko, is one of the most brilliant young scientists I've ever worked with. She's nominally a graduate student, but she's been uh, teaching Phil and I physics ever since she arrived. And so it's been a really fun time. But I can't talk about any of that, so we're going to go back to core business. So um, <clears throat> if we go uh, back now in time to what we were first doing, as well as doing the de Haas van Alphen, uh, we wanted to measure Shubnikov de Haas, so we set up a uh, pretty low resolution, uh, low voltage, high resolution resistivity measurement. Sounds simple, but it's uh, not entirely trivial to get going. And when we measured the resistivity at low temperatures very precisely, we realized uh, that we could not fit a T to the fifth uh, dependence of resistivity to what we were measuring. And the deviation doesn't look so big there. I could make it look bigger on a log-log plot if you wanted. But you know, we looked at it many times, didn't believe it, and realized that it just wasn't working. Now, there can be corrections to the t to the fifth because of dimensionality. But to my knowledge, they would always be corrections to make that power lower, not higher. So there's really a problem here. And then just empirically, amazingly, we found that we could fit an exponential resistivity onset. So, the blue line that you can't see because it's running almost essentially perfectly through the data is that exponential onset, and I don't know what's happening. Okay, we have a freeze. Uh -huh. Maybe I just talked for too long on that. Okay. Good. So, so we were, you know, I was, we were fitting this um, exponential onset of resistivity and not knowing what the hell was going on. And here I want to advertise, and particularly because I'm looking forward to doing it again. If you ever get lucky enough to be invited by Steve Kivelson to spend some time at Stanford, you have to do it. Because what you do is you go there, you may be thinking about some data. I was thinking about this data. You sit in the sun for most of the day, drinking good coffee and eating excellent food and talking with Steve and his friends. And they know things, so they tell you particularly stuff about the past. And Chandra Varma was there. And we were talking about this at lunch, and he said, you know, uh, phonon drag is, of course, well known. And there was a huge effort to see a phonon drag term in the resistivity of the alkali metals. It was inconclusive. Maybe this is what you're seeing. And here's the, here's the logic. So, yes. So, uh, if T0 is 165, yeah. that means B is very large, right? The, 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 this fit to A plus B. Well, the, 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 B, the B is, the, the T0 is really about the characteristic temperature of onset of the term. Yeah, but, you, but it's, it's 165 Kelvin. Yeah. So, so, so that means B is very large. That 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the but the physical meaning of b in this situation, it's not like you're looking at a standard term. I think it's you know the physical meaning. This is an unusual uh, temperature dependence of resistivity. So I don't assign any particular physical meaning to that b term. I do assign a physical meaning to t naught, and we're going to sh sh show that in a moment. I mean, uh, you know, it's saying that it's certainly saying that okay, this is on an expanded scale, but uh, you know, the the whatever the B term is doing has uh, nearly doubled the resistivity. I mean, A is very small because the residual resistivity is very small. I I, I mean, I mean, Cameron, yeah, you. So there is a very slight increase in resistivity there at low temperatures, but I mean it's on the scale you're seeing, and I, I ignore it. It's somewhat sample dependent. But you know, if you if you cool cool volt or the volt or also copper, you see the counter effect. Do you think this is ah, people. Uh, we'll get back to that later. Um, I. Probably don't. Others who work on this compound definitely do. What I can tell you is that it is definitely sample dependent. And uh, yeah, I mean, again, I'd prefer to talk with you about that offline. It's not a possibility to rule out, but I, I don't. Well, the other, okay, the one reason is when you look at the magneto resistance here, even in the region where the resistivity is going up a little bit, it's uniformly positive. There's no sign that you're coming towards the negative magneto resistance that I might expect to have a condo system. Right, but uh, that's, but can we, yeah, can we proceed and talk about that offline? That would be, I'm very happy to do that. So, what we, now in this, I'm, I was going to say, anyway, I'm well prepared to entertain the possibility that this interpretation is completely wrong, right, but it's part of the history of the decision making we took. The, the thing about, uh, but it is interesting historically, and I was really proud when I came here that I was going to talk about going back and reading Piles' original work in the 1930s. First lecture I hear is somebody reading Newton's Principii, so how on earth can I be impressive? But anyway, I, I did go back and I read this debate. And when Bloch and Grunison first wrote down the Bloch Grunison law, uh, Piles was the guy who said, I don't believe it. He wrote, I do not believe the bloch grunison law because I don't believe the assumption which is implicit in it, which is that as you drive the electrons out of equilibrium by applying an electric field, the phonons stay in equilibrium with no momentum and you just scatter from them. He said, I believe the, the phonons will come along for the ride with the electrons and that you will get an exponential onset of resistivity. And, uh, and that was looked for, as I say, there are RevMod physics about potassium where people were debating whether or not they could see that in potassium. Here we had this exponential law. So in the spirit of what I said to you before, the idea is that if it's an, uh, if it's, uh, if it's, okay, so the idea is that if you're dragging the phonons, you won't see the electron phonon scattering, the normal electron phonon scattering in the resistivity. But what you will see is the onset of electron phonon umclap and the electron phonon umclap will onset with a criterion which is related to the uh, k space distance that you have to overcome and the sound velocity because that controls the rate at which your phonons get wave vector with temperature, the acoustic phonons. So the prediction is that if you have an electron phonon umclap and that's the only scattering you're seeing, you can calculate an umclap temperature just from very simply. And when we did that, the umclap temperature that we calculated was within about 15% of this one that we completely empirically uh, deduced from the exponential function there. So, so that makes this, I would call this a semi-quantitative speculation rather than a complete speculation. So the difference between this and the Bloch-Grunison temperature is just the k difference? No, the, diff the difference in the bloch, the, the bloch grunison uh, law says that you always see the phonons. When you've got small q phonons and you scatter from them, you see that in the resistivity. Yes. Pyle said you won't. I mean, phonon drag, of course, is well established. It was being talked about earlier on uh, in the conference. And that's this idea that the phonons and the electrons are so strongly coupled that if they move very efficiently together, then the normal electron phonon processes aren't seen. 
And, you know, in terms of the expression for the temperature, it looks very similar. You just replace the K of the Fermi surface to the K between Fermi surfaces. That's correct, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Okay. yeah. Do you have an idea why the T squared due to electron electron is not seen? Yeah, because of Ashcroft and Merman reasons. This is uh, uh, in the sense that if you read Ashcroft and Merman's book, it still says, you know, it, although it might look like a mystery that T squared has never been seen, uh, when you calculate it, because it was written in 75, when you calculate it, it's so small that the resolution of experiments on things like aluminium just isn't good enough to pick it up. So the T squared term here is extremely small because of that. We have a large Fermi velocity. Yeah. I completely agree with you, sir, but if you had not this annoying uh, you know, observer, yeah. you would I'm have seen it because in yeah, yeah, good, could be, yeah, good. And everything I'm saying here, you know, it's the old fact and fiction philosophy. Here, I've showed you the facts, this interpretation could all be fiction, right? <laughs> but I wanted to put it in because right from the beginning, I was thinking, okay, we never, you know, we never set out to find phonon drag, but if we have it, when people start thinking about hydrodynamics, dragged phonons become the friend of hydrodynamics, whereas ordinary phonons are its foe. Right? And, uh, and this idea of dragged phonons being the friend of hydrodynamics was another paper by Gurji in the 1960s. So uh, you know, I didn't know about that paper when we started developing the pseudo-logic, uh, but you know, it just seemed obvious to try it. So that was the motivation. I think in the end, uh, it's unrelated to what we actually saw, and that will be the end of the talk, but that's why we did it. So what we decided, I was working then, or talking a lot with Philip Mull, who had been pioneering these techniques of focused iron beam sculpting and applying them crucially to interesting materials, if you like. Typically, mesoscopic physics has been done on very, very simple materials, and Philip has done fantastic work on bringing exotic materials into the mesoscopic regime. And he and I, you always want a plan B, so we did set out to try and look at hydrodynamics, because I said that might be interesting. But you know, we didn't for a moment believe we would see anything, at least I didn't, so you want a plan B. But the plan B was pretty obvious because uh, he's developing these techniques for microstructuring. We have something that we believe has a 20 micron mean free path before you structure it. What you want to know is do you damage it when you're structuring it because if you're not damaging it, then the structuring techniques become important in other areas of physics. So we set out just to investigate that. And the type of things that Philip was making, this is a, a more beautiful device from Nabanil and Nandi, who was here earlier in the week. But basically, he was doing this. He was taking a crystal. We were sculpting that crystal, or one like it, with a fib. And everything that's dark here is where we've blasted the crystal away. The light thing is the conducting channel. We put multiple contacts on it for bookkeeping so that we know we're making a valid measurement. Um, and the experiment was just to study whether or not there was hydrodynamic-like flow. So we would make it, he would make a channel measure it, res resistance is a function of temperature as well, just for completeness, and field. Take it back to the fib, thin the channel down by a factor of two, take it back, do the measurement again, and do all of that sequentially on the same crystal. That's the thing, that's a way of cutting out. Uh, you know, we can't gate these things because they're monovalent, so we don't have that as a control, but we can play with their shape better than, than more easily than you can in some of the other mesoscopic systems. <coughs> And in the process, he changed the channel width from about 60 microns to about 700 nanometers, and we just went on measuring and measuring. So now, this is what we got. This is uh, units that we discussed, I discussed before in, the, uh, in my first lecture. You, uh -huh, I've lost my pointer again. This is a high-tech thing, which I don't, it's beyond me. Um, so you express both axes in dimensionless units. This is the resistivity that you measure of the channel divided by the resistivity that you measured when the channel was so wide that you thought you were measuring an infinitely wide crystal. And you're plotting it against the inverse width normalized to what you believe to be the momentum relaxing mean free path. And, what we, and in those units, there's a very nice paper by Benacker and Van Houten from 91 where they reviewed all this. They and others have showed that if you plot things like this, and you just assume, which is reasonable for us, diffusive boundary conditions, there are no free parameters left in that blue trace of how the resistivity should evolve if you are only considering ballistic or ohmic physics. So this is a kinetic calculation. If, however, you give yourself um, the uh, option of putting a bit of electron viscosity in, 
to the extent that you think that you have, for some magic reason, a momentum conserving mean free path, which is a tenth of the momentum relaxing one, the theory predicts something like the red line, and the data look more like the red line than the blue line, and that's the entire content of what, uh, what that first paper was about. However, there is a little bit more because there are several things here. If I blow up at low temperatures, there's the, uh, there's the low temperature uh, uh, width dependence to think of, and it seemed to be not inconsistent with some curvature of that line, which would be consistent with the hydrodynamic calculation. There is the width at which, at which the two curves cross has some physical meaning, and then there's what happens at very narrow wires. And basically, those three key facts of what we were deducing seem to match. And so I, I really wondered about whether to submit this paper or not, because that was all we had. But it seemed like an interesting thing, and so we submitted it. And it sits there, and I don't think anything is wrong in the measurements. We're going to say later there may have been something wrong in the analysis. Yes? Each point is the same sample uh, sculpted down to a different width. So they're a different sample in one way, but they're all made from the same crystal and with the same basic contacts to the extent that you can. Yeah. And these squares over, what's the estimate? Oh, so, so yeah, that was in the table for the first time. Uh, there is no way in hell that this is due to electron-electron scattering. We have a Fermi temperature of 27,000 degrees. So we're the people who always called this the momentum conserving length rather than the electron-electron length, because from word one, we knew that, right? And we say in the paper that our excuse is phonon drag. Maybe it could be phonon drag, and we had a phononic source of momentum conserving scattering. I'm going to say at the end, I don't believe that's true either. OK, well, so I told you I was going to be as hard on me as we are on the others. Yes? Just, can you, because the red curve, which is the conventional, no, sorry, the, the blue curve, which is the conventional curve without any yeah. momentum conserving it. Right. Yeah, it, why, why does the blue curve bend over? Very good. It bends over for reasons that have been implicitly discussed earlier on. At least this is what Bainacker um, I, I ascribes it to. Even for a circular Fermi surface, you're in, some of your electrons are going parallel on the wire. So there, those particular parallel electrons in the simplest model have the ability to slightly short out all the ones which are being forced to do the boundary scattering. And that becomes important at wide wires. Huh? OK, so that's what we published. There were many things we then wanted to check. And one of the questions is what we could get out of this fitting was a ratio between the two mean free paths. But obviously, when you're thinking about physical processes, you want to know in real units what you think your momentum conserving mean free path is. And that, in our game, it was dependent on us believing that, that what the resistivity was telling us, that we really had a momentum relaxing mean free path of tens of microns. Right? And again, you know, materially, that seemed so implausible that it was worth checking. So we decided, after some uh, help uh, in taking that decision from Leonid, Levitov to go back, I say, to the past and try and do some transverse electron focusing in devices made from these crystals. So you've heard about that already in the conference. You, you would have had ballistic trajectories from a point contact injection. But as you apply a field, if you have a circular Fermi surface, you change those into uh, field uh, shifted trajectories. Every now and then, you hit just the right field to match them up with a probe contact. And you can get harmonics of that. And every time you get a harmonic of that, you see your resistivity changing. So you expect, expect to see field-dependent oscillations. So this is the type of thing which can be done with these FIB techniques. They really are fantastic. So this is the very first focusing device that Maya Bachman ever made. There, we were going to inject current here. And we were going to try and measure voltages at a series of contacts going away from it. But the spacing of those contacts was set pretty big, I mean, this and similar devices early on, to see whether we got any verification of the fact that we should have a mean free path of tens of microns. And uh, this wasn't the very first data we took, but just recently, there's a 35 micron contact separation with about eight or nine well-resolved focusing oscillations. So when you see that, I think it's very difficult to argue that you don't have a mean free path in everybody's sense of tens of microns. So we saw that. That's nice. Uh, Maya's just writing this work up, so I think it will come on the archive soon. Uh, what we also saw after a lot of uh, 
heart aching and, and hand waving and she then realized was that there was a very, so what we were always doing was working in the orientation that I'm showing the data from here and you get a very pronounced double uh, peak shoulder structure in the focusing peaks and we could never understand why that was. And then she suddenly realized that maybe it was because of the orientation of the Fermi surface, this very faceted Fermi surface relative to the injection direction. And there's a special thing about 60 degrees that if you make a 90 degree change, it's like a, third, a, six, a six fold material. A 90 degree change is like a 30 degree change, which is exactly what you want to go from, if you like, the maximally flat di direction injection to the maximally uh, cornered correct di um, injection direction. And sure enough, the line, the line shape that you see changes completely. So there was a very strong orientational effect there. And then we uh, uh, went and collaborated with uh, David Goldhaber Gordon's group because we were entering this field unhindered by any knowledge of ballistic physics whatsoever. And so we decided we'd better work with somebody who knew what they were doing. And, uh, and they have this very nice Monte Carlo code uh, where they inject a lot of trajectories. Usually they use circular uh, trajectories, but we just sent them a, a harmonic fit to our Fermi surface. So they put in the correct Fermi surface and what they were able to see is, I mean, I was going to say, who needs all of these current measuring devices when you have Monte Carlo as nice as this? Look, uh, this is definitely what you guys will see. So here at zero field, you inject your current there. That's the ballistic straight across trajectory, high current density. What more do you need? And then, um, and then you gradually increase the field. And as you increase the field, this is their simulation showing a distant focusing. There's no scattering in here at all, so you also see the harmonic of it. And then as they increase the field higher, you get more and more uh, closely spaced focusing uh, bits where you get a maximum apparent current and therefore you get the oscillations. Why don't you see the other sources of density? Well, well you do in some of these, right? So uh, you... Um, well, you know, in this, it's the same. Okay, it's the same spirit as why. Why don't you see? Uh, why do you only see semicircles? Because you're injecting from half the thing, right? And uh, I quite enjoy this. I should have put this animated. There's the experiment. There's the theory. <laughs> we, we, from my neck of the woods, you like it when things are that way around. And uh, they were able to model uh, in both directions. I'm only showing one direction. They were able to model what we were seeing as well as that. And I think that's a pretty good match. And the interesting but slightly sad thing was that uh, modulo a few details that they don't get right, they get almost everything right, and that simulation does not contain any hydrodynamics at all. So the answer is when we try to do a ballistic experiment, and Leonid had warned us it would be like this because there's some similarity to the situation in graphene. When you look for ballistics, you find them. When you look for hydrodynamics, you find that. And there's quite a big overlap region between the two. So at, at best, that's what we have here. All of, so these, what I'm showing you is low temperature measurement. These oscillations persist up to about 40 Kelvin. But the question is the following. If assume that hydrodynamic is not a zero temperature, mm -hmm. it's a window. So so end, of, end of talk, end of talk. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very good question. It's what I'm going to, I'm building to a non-triumphant crescendo to tell you why this is. Yes. So by the way, uh, uh, Leonid's argument is that they can both coexist. No, of course. Some modes would survive here and some I, I understand that can be, but I mean, but not at these temperatures in any sensible microscopic picture you have. And so, uh, but actually empirically, what we're going to find is that what we see, even at low temperatures, is this dual signature, actually. And then the question is why. Right. So anyway, um, once you realize that directionality is important, uh, Maya then did the very smart thing very quickly. She made another set of shapes. And these shapes just said, OK, we're going to pass current along one long path, but we're going to change the angle of that path so that in the same crystal, we're changing the current direction relative to the Fermi surface. In a triangular lattice material, the bulk resistivity has to be isotropic by symmetry. But here, we're breaking the symmetry by going out of the thermodynamic limit towards smaller scale material. And we see an absolutely huge effect. So this is, uh, and we haven't done any uh, careful work. Is there a? Oh. 
Oh, good. I'll just use that instead. Uh, we haven't done any careful work to optimize this. This is for a 2.5 micron channel width. The resistivity at low temperatures is over a factor of two higher along the hard direction than it is along the easy direction. So you can make the wires thinner and you can work harder on your alignment and who knows how big an anisotropy you can stimulate there, but it's a, to me an extremely unexpected result. So you might also, that you might say then that the, you've broke it, you know, you've gone out of the uh, thermodynamic limit by making something relatively small on the length scales that you have, but that you've kind of stimulated some of what you're seeing by imposing these very special directions. So again, from the posters, uh -huh. uh, Philip McGuinness and uh, Elena Giacchina, uh, stimulated by some conversation with Lawrence Mollenkamp, have been making squares, uh, but on the slightly uh, reduced length scales. So here there is a you know, square symmetry. You wouldn't particularly expect within that symmetry, unless there was extra physics, you wouldn't expect that contact configuration that I'm showing and that one to be doing something different, uh, but they are, and it was on the poster, and not only are they doing something pronouncedly different, you can see the effects of that difference up to square edges of about 100 microns. So again, evidence that the ballistic mean free path here must be very, very long. So we definitely have a long mean free path. Why? Well, uh, there's a twofold answer to this. So again, time's running on. These are essentially theory papers, so they're on the archive. I'd encourage you to go and read them if you're interested. One of the things is that because you have a d-electron Fermi surface in two dimensions, and because of the d-orbitals involved, you get a very pre a pronounced natural momentum orbital locking. Right? And that, I think, is inevitable for a Fermi surface in a material of this symmetry. That momentum orbital locking means that you're in an unusual situation where you have rather suppressed side scattering uh, uh, where, but still pretty good backscattering. But when you integrate that right around the Fermi surface at room temperature, you get, for weak scattering, you get about a factor of three or four uh, suppression of total scattering rate relative to a circular S electron Fermi surface of the same volume. So for your room temperature stuff, maybe that begins to explain to you why the room temperature resistivity was so much lower than, say, the resistivity of elemental uh, platinum. Okay. But it doesn't explain the low temperature stuff. So for the low temperature stuff, it implies that you have an incredibly perfect material. Right? And this then, as a materials group, really took some guts. We swallowed and we said, we're going to go and work with an electron microscopy group. And normally that is really bad for your ego. Right? Because you bring your beautiful material to an electron microscopist and they send you back a micrograph that says that your material and by implication, you are full of crap, right? <laughs> and so that's definitely what I expected to happen. Uh, and it didn't, and this is amazing. Celeste Chang in Dave Muller's group wants to study defect energies, and she can't find any defects in these crystals unless she makes them with the electron microscope. So in a total scan region of 15 microns, she looked as hard as she could for anything big, couldn't find it, and the others just used examples of the perfection as you magnify. But literally, they couldn't find any defects. And so for some reason, and this is the bit that excites me most about the Delphocytes, here you have a material whose free energy of formation is so deeply and steeply peaked around the stoichiometric uh, compound that accidentally you're growing something perfect. And you know, I never believed that could happen. I never thought I'd see that in my scientific career. And then there's further um, uh, ways you can confirm that. Because uh, a lot of people in the room have influenced this. After a really nice conversation with Steve Kivelson, Veronica was getting bored with rewriting the history of photo emissions, so she wanted to do something else. And she decided that, uh, Steve said, you know, this idea of you deliberately disorder something to really know whether you're in the zero disorder limit or not, that's a smart thing to do. So Veronica set up a program with uh, an electron beam irradiation facility in Paris that Philip and Elena are now working on as well. And the result of that is really striking. When we put defects in, we definitely see those defects. The resistivity of the material changes as a function of dose at the same rate as that of copper, right? And so there's no, there really seems to be no question that somehow this material is naturally extremely perfect and its cousins. So I, I like that a lot. 
So now just the last few minutes, let's go back to the, where we were. So we've, we've showed that we have a great material, showed that we have interesting ballistics and a very long momentum relaxing mean free path. Do we now, can we turn on a magnetic field and go to some of the things that Joey was telling about, us about earlier, uh, study the magnetotransport and what do we see? Do we see just a ballistic signal or do we make ourselves think we have a bit of both? And I think the answer is that you can convince yourself you've got a bit of both. So Thomas Scafidi has done these very nice simulations for us as well. We have a bulk magneto resistance, so we've measured it very carefully, just published that, and we divide it out. That's the point that I was making to people earlier on. It's much better if you can divide it out. Uh, once you do that, the prediction for how the magneto resistance should look is that you should get a peak, and this is this idea that Joe explained very well, where this is Knudsen physics, and then you're beginning to chop off the boundaries um, uh, by the cyclotron orbit effects. The simulations tell you that you're expecting to get something extremely sharp uh, in a ballistic case at exactly double the, the cyclotron, when the cyclotron diameter equals the width. We saw an example of that earlier on. In contrast, the hydrodynamic prediction would have no peak and it would have a much more gradual onset, not at any particular value of the width relative to the cyclotron radius of where it began to flatten out. I'm saying this because now when you look at the data, obviously we see very strong signs in the data of the ballistic stuff, but we also see non-zero signs of the hydrodynamic stuff in that uh, you wouldn't be too surprised if your data didn't have the absolute sharp kink in it that the, that the uh, uh, simulation said. But the way it spreads out there certainly looks a lot more like it's got a lot more in common with the hydro stuff than it does with the ballistic stuff. So to that extent, we still have some mixed signature. Anyway, we were, I was pretty fed up with that situation. I don't like making statements like that if you can make a better one. So I thought I had a clever idea. It's always a dangerous time. Uh, and, and, uh, and the other point, though, is just to re-emphasize, there's a 2 Kelvin on there. So again, this is an extremely low temperature measurement. So I thought, well, that's bad. Let's go to high temperatures. Then we can maybe find this hydrodynamic window that we've all been talking about. And uh, you can do lots of experiments. And again, I stress the bulk magneto resistance is positive. The magneto resistance of the wires is less positive. So when you divide one by the other, you get a negative magneto resistance. But this isn't a raw negative magneto resistance. And here we've gone into this regime that we were slightly mentioning with Shahal during the first talk. Here, by this time, all our characteristic length scales are much shorter because we've gone up, uh, whatever they are, they've all got shorter as we've gone up in temperature. So we have very wide wires relative to the microscopic scales. Therefore, the scale of the effect that we're seeing is extremely small. So uh, this is a, talk from, uh, a slide from the March meeting talk that I gave in, in great excitement and triumph because we just established with Thomas Scafidi that we could make with out too much cheating, we could make a really good match between the data and the experiment. So uh, it was time to apply the, uh, the old declare success and bask in glory uh, treatment. But there were still so many things we didn't understand. And one of the things we decided was at that time, just numerically, it's very numerically intensive to do field dependent kinetic calculations for very wide wires, for obvious reasons. You're taking into account a lot of collisions. Nobody had ever done it, and we decided that before we got too uh, taken up with the Navier-Stokes analysis, we'd better see whether a kinetic equation, a kinetic treatment, told us that that type of data would be unique to a hydrodynamic regime and whether we could get it or not when we just had momentum relaxing scattering. Sadly, 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 of course, the answer was that that Lorentzian-like decay that everybody in the field-dependent transport business says is hydrodynamic can be hydrodynamic, but it doesn't have to be hydrodynamic. It's like many of the other things we've seen. So at that point, we have a complete draft with all the references written properly and everything, and we just thought, no, nothing to submit because we don't understand things well enough. So we, we licked our wounds and we went away to try and understand things better. And this is the point I wanted to close on because for me as an experimentalist wanting to decide what experimental data means, it's really important. But it's theory, so there's something really dangerous because I don't have Scafidi here to defend himself if I, if I do down what he did. Right, <clears throat> so it's the most simple uh, thing you can do for a simple flow 
with a circular Fermi surface, no complications with your scattering, but you're saying you have some momentum relaxing scattering and some momentum conserving scattering, so everything we've been doing all week. So you solve that, uh, you, could, you know, you could do it numerically, but you also do it analytically by uh, using the Boltzmann approach, and you express everything in terms of the deviation from the equilibrium distribution as usual. But you express that in Fourier components of that deviation. And we're not putting anything special in like odd even harmonics here, just doing the d totally dumb thing as a dumb uh, model. When you do that, you discover that you can set up a transport equation in the first harmonic of the, uh, of the deviation of the distribution that contains a viscosity and that is just your Boltzmann equation map onto the Navier-Stokes equation that you would use in the presence of momentum relaxing scattering, right? The second moment comes in because the scattering rate in the, the, of the second moment is what is going in to getting the viscosity in the normal way. So this is a normal thing. You couple to current in the first moment, so that gives you momentum relaxation. Your momentum conserving thing is the second moment thing, and it goes into determining your viscosity. Yes, but no, and this is the crucial thing, because that gamma 2 is not simply the momentum conserving rate. It's the sum of the momentum conserving and momentum relaxing rate. Right? And if your momentum conserving rate in your dreams is 100 times higher than your momentum relaxing rate, that doesn't matter at all. Everything's good. But none of us are in that regime. We're always in the regime where those two rates are comparable. And if they're comparable, something that looks in a flow experiment just like a viscosity could have had its origin in momentum relaxing scattering. And that's the key thing. And for, for experimental interpretation, I think that's a, not a showstopper, but it's just absolutely vital that we bear that in mind. And that means several, and that then gets you into very difficult philosophical things about what you're going to mean about viscous flow. Even though it's momentum relaxing, if it's come at high temperatures from electron phonon scattering, that electron phonon scattering is helping you to establish a local equilibrium. And you would say you're kind of hydrodynamic and that, that doesn't really matter. But what we are seeing, we now believe, and there's a lot of number comparisons we can do to make me believe that, is that when we're looking at it at low temperatures, what we're seeing is the impurity cross-section momentum relaxing term going into a viscous-like term in, in, our, in our theory, right? And that is then uh, elastic scattering. So that does not, it satisfies the flow equation thing of giving you something looking like a viscous term, but it does not satisfy the local equilibration thing that a finite temperature process would do. So I think we all have, we certainly have to be very aware of it. I think the vial metal people have to be aware of this as well. And it's potentially a big uh, complication. But, you know, it's a, and, and it can also be made, if you like, much more pronounced because I said this was a really simple thing. But many real materials, including semiconductors, of course, they exist because you have a funny impurity cross section. You have an impurity cross section which is strongly biased towards small angle scattering. So the impurities actually don't relax momentum very efficiently at all. And if you start to put those effects in with this general philosophy, you can end up getting a, an even bigger separation of scales between your viscous contribution and your non-viscous contribution from impurity scattering. So I'm guessing that what we're seeing is actually all of that. Um, I can't be 100% certain, but that, I think that's what's being seen. And I should also say that this is our toy model that we worked out to try and understand why we didn't understand our experiment. But Alex Seyf has, he didn't write it out explicitly, but his paper does basically exactly the same. Or he makes comments that say he did exactly the same thing. Yes? Uh, if there's no momentum conserving uh, rate, so gamma, gamma MC is zero. Yeah. You still get the gamma MR in, in the viscous term. The effect that, yeah. So yeah. Still, you're, going to, you're saying you're, you're going to get resistivity uh, that's non local, probably on the scale of the mean three parts. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I haven't thought of the full implications, but you're still going to be able to do a flow. And, you know, the kinetic calculations, I guess the guys that work with Thomas know it's horrible. You can just, because he can just, you'll have a qualitative te temperature or field dependence or width dependence of something. He will then turn off the momentum conserving scattering altogether. 
the size and the magnitude of what you're seeing goes away hugely if you've been looking for the right type of thing. But the qualitative temperature or field dependence or width dependence of it doesn't. And, and that's the thing which is the killer, because if we're always going to be, many of us are going to be looking at the edges of applicability of electron hydrodynamics, unless we can get really strongly into that regime, we're always prone to errors of interpretation based on that, I think. So, so this is true if you look on the current, but if you look on the whole field, it's not easier. Well, OK, good. Yeah, very good. OK, but then, well, I hope we are soon giving you our samples to start looking at the whole field at, and then we can re-talk in a year's time about how confident you are. I've made so many confident statements at talks that I now regret over the years on this topic that, yeah, <laughs> let's see. So. Um, the other great thing uh, about the future, to the extent that we, this is as close as I've ever come to having a strategy. Um, very simple logic. We don't know a priori whether, we, we do know that there are many semiconductors in the Delphosite structure. Uh, we don't know yet whether any of them are growing as perfectly as the metals are growing, but until we go and do some experiments, we can't rule that out. So that's the next thing we're going to do. Growth-wise, we've already started. There's a crystal of a Delavosite semiconductor, and we intend to be trying to work on that very hard. They're quite wide gap semiconductors, so you're going to need electrolyte gating to start playing the, uh, the conductivity games there. But I want to get into that business, and we'll see what happens. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, oops, somehow. OK, my, I have screwed up. My conclusion slides have, have disappeared. But uh, I'm going to stop talking now, and you can imagine what the conclusions would have been. <laughs> so if uh, some of these experiments are related to quantum drag, is there a possibility in the experiment to block the electrons, let quantum go on, and then pick it up to the electrons again? So don't well, the, the I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, and I, I, you're, but you are reminding me to say something more about the phonon drag. The reason that I don't believe that the phonon drag is giving us a contribution to what we're seeing is back to what Cameron, I think, was hinting at. You've lost all your phonons by 2 Kelvin as well, essentially. But there is going to be a window of temperature where we might, for this, we might actually be genuinely hydrodynamic if the phonon drag is true. And it's going to be very interesting to start looking at, at flow in those intermediate temperatures and see if we can pick that region up. And, and then, and the, yeah, yeah. So, so what I'm saying is, yeah, the the observed resistivity is the observed resistivity is because of this strange physics, is nearly flat to nearly 20 Kelvin. I've been telling you about stuff at 3 Kelvin. Working at 16 or 18 Kelvin may prove to be a smarter place to really do some detailed stuff. But uh, the results of the simulation which you showed were the mole experiment compared uh, the measurements to, to simulations. Yeah. They were still obtained with the kinetic theory. Yeah, the, the result okay, very good. The results were contained with the kinetic theory, but the uh, but the point is, yes, they were contained with a theory where you used the Callaway uh, ansatz to put in uh, an electron electron momentum conserving like term. This is a, you know you're helping me uh, complete the loop. That may well not have been a smart thing to do. You see, that's but, but our logic at the time was that's what you had. It didn't have to be. If, you know, that, you, we, are, we were only ever analyzing at one temperature. So as far as we were concerned, that uh, collision integral was telling you about a, so, a way of putting momentum conserving scattering in, right? Uh, uh, and you know, we didn't care whether it was electron electron or not. And until we started talking about temperature dependencies, it wasn't going to matter. What I'm now saying at the end is, and we've actually done calculations to show this, particularly if we play these cross-section games, we don't need to put the electron-electron scattering in in that way into the collision integral to get something like our data. We can do it just with, the, with a, a modified impurity cross-section, at least to some extent, a worryingly high extent. Right? And, uh, and so you know, we use the theory we used to analyze the data we had probably wasn't the right theory. And I think, but I think we now understand why. Okay. But still, they had the uh, like 
Oh, yeah. I mean, well, that's that's what I'm currently thinking. Is it may only be with impurity scattering, but it looks just like a viscous tan, right? I mean, that's what I was trying to show you at the end. So, so then we just get in almost to semantics about what, you know whether we believe that's important or not. Two questions: um, uh, other measurements. Uh, is thermal conductance correspondingly large in this material? And uh, second is AC conductance. Does it fit a very large? Uh, yeah. So uh, two answers. Um, the yeah the the at very low temperatures you get plausibly close to coming back towards Vidam and France being obeyed. So there is a big there's a big dip in the thermal conductance, and so you know again in the thermal power shows features that make you you know not say that the phonon drag hypothesis isn't completely crazy. Uh, the fact that you get Vidam in France coming back, as I recall, at 2 Kelvin or something, that says the thermal conductance is very large, just as, as the electron conductance. And then if you go on to the AC stuff, um, there's a paper on the archive that I should have referenced here by Chris Holmes, uh, where he's been studying the optical conductivity. The optical conductivity, there are some things in there that are slightly surprising. Things look a little bit broader maybe than you would have expected them to look based on, certainly based on a 25 micron mean free path. Um, uh, but, and there are other things in there that we don't totally understand either, but uh, I can send you those papers. That was put on the archive a couple of months ago. One of the great things is another of the gifts of this material is that there's a perfect gap at some point um, uh, where you just get no optical conductivity at all. So, you know, the interband stuff is pushed off to energies where you, so you get a region of energy where the conductivity is zero. So uh, that means that you have a far higher degree of precision than usual for deciding cutoffs for doing Kramer's Kronig and things. And this is something that Chris Holmes was really stressing. So they do actually look quite interesting optically as well. So uh, you're very demanding in your analysis, but you know, I have a very nice question. You see this curve for the bulk system where this is already very remarkable for many reasons you said, the resistivity is 7 nano ohm centimeter, yeah. you have this you know, exponential behavior, uh, the, a lot of things. So if you put one of these five feet samples, which are much smaller, mm -hmm. presumably the residual resistivity is higher because there is, yeah, I mean, th this is uh, the, well, the resistivity measured at low temperatures is, is exactly what was going into that, uh, that plot where we decided we had hydrodynamic flow. So, yeah, the resistivity goes up because of the boundary well, current scattering. The, the, the kind of but I was wondering about the temperature dependence. So just, does this feed, for example, hold this exponential feed with the prefactor and the T-naught for all these microstructure samples? We have not checked. So it, I, I'm assuming it wouldn't, and so I assumed it wouldn't so hard that we haven't checked that very carefully. Yeah, mm. We all agree, you know, that, that you have momentum relaxing and momentum yeah. conserving events. The whole thing is it's a soup you all do, but it should show up if you are looking for some deviation that this simple picture won't fail because the yeah. way you are. No, actually, actually, no. Let me let me take it. Take what I said back. The platinum c c compound, and this is something I wanted to talk to you about, the platinum compound shows sometimes an upturn of resistivity at low temperatures that we find very hard to understand and we think probably isn't Kondo, but it is there. On that one, Nabonila did a very careful systematic study of whether you saw like a Matthiessen's rule or not as you thinned the samples down. And basically it does look there like you see a Matthiessen's rule. So it's like you're adding the boundary scattering straight additively to everything else. I've, I've got that data with me, we can talk about that. There's something else I, want, I thought you were going to ask about fib damage, and you were reminding me to tell you guys something just unbelievable about this fib. Right? It just tells you again, you've got to sometimes trust your Monte Carlo. So according to Monte Carlo calculations about um, a focused ion beam entry into a material of, with these atomic number elements in it, what you should get is a kind of diffuse implantation over a, either an edge width or a depth of about 10 nanometers is what you calculate. Seems very hard to imagine. But in, to make those um, electron focusing devices, sometimes with very close contact separation, you have to make your crystal extremely thin, and we can't exfoliate these crystals. So incredibly, Maya was able to take a crystal which was, say, 10 microns thick, blast it from the top with a raster, 
to make a one micron thick crystal before she put all the contacts on it, and we still see the focusing with the quality I showed you. So that's telling you that that top blasting and that level of sculpting is really not putting any rubbish into your crystal that's affecting what you see, which experimentally is very heartening. I just had one comment. I wanted to cheer you up a little. Bit. Oh. <laughs> I, I looked on Google Scholar. <laughs> and uh, Delaphosites have 6,370 citations to vile semi metals, only 7,700. Google Scholar? Yeah. But even better, McKenzie. <laughs> Get stuffed. <laughs> I am so glad that the microphone doesn't pick you up, Kimmelson. <laughs> this uh, small angle, uh, small angle of elastic scattering that uh, you explain can mimic viscosity. Um, can you get the strength of that from truly computer oscillations? In principle, you can, and, uh, and, and very good. I, I, again, I should have said that. The Dingle mean free pass that you fit out when you do a quantum oscillation measurement here is a factor of 20 to 30 smaller than the resistive mean free pass. So, so you know, that, if you take that at face value, it says there's a tremendous amount of, of small angle scattering going on. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, in this bit, do you think about this material as a 2D material? Or a 2D material? Yeah, sorry, I, 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 again, I should have said that. The, well, I, did, I mentioned it, but I didn't stress it. The resistive anisotropy is a factor of several thousand. Mm -hmm. So you think of it as just a par our devices are parallel stacks of, of more or less uncoupled 2D layers. And we have 1,000 to 10,000 of them in our devices, that kind of level. I think you try to fit it, I think in 2D it should be T to the fourth. So if you, well, any, any, no, so the thing is, any lower power is going to be steeper looking, so the fit's going to be worse. There's no question. Yeah? So why do you actually need to make the sample so thin then? Oh, you, you need to make the sample so thin because if you want to, some of those focusing experiments were done with 250 micron, um, nanometer wide point contacts. Just, well, mechanically, but also you always get fib. One of the things in fib is you get redeposition. So you get the stuff you're blasting away doesn't always go just out to ether where you want it. So if you've got too much of it around, it gets very, very hard to make well-defined features. The way to think about the electrons going through is that you essentially just have a bunch of Experiments in parallel. That's correct. We, we have 1,000 to 10,000 experiments in parallel on these devices, yeah. Maybe it's a silly question because typically the, this effect is small, but can there be a Coulomb drag between the layers? Yeah. Become, um, it's smaller than the collision, but you know, maybe. Yeah, I, uh, yes, in principle, there can be, and I really haven't thought properly about what the consequences of that might be. I mean, presumably, if it was going on, it would be manifest in, in the measured properties like this one. So regarding this, so how far this exponential thing goes? Uh, uh, it, second, yeah. So that you were a little skeptical about your own interpretation. Yeah. Uh, what is the alternative? I, I'm not particularly, I mean, uh, something else. <laughs> so, you know, I just, like you always, I don't know. Uh, I'm also very careful to be skeptical about my own interpretations because I've just gone, you know, beamed around the world being skeptical about other people's interpretations of their work. I mean, I just think you sh you've always got anything which is based on a fit or anything like this, you, you know, you have to do cross checks. And so here we did the fit, it worked out well. We did the one cross check we could think of, that's worked out well. Take your choice really whether you regard that as killer evidence of it or not. And then the other answer is not unnaturally, it doesn't go much higher than 30 Kelvin. Uh, that's why I cut the graph off here. Um, but uh, you know, it's not clear that it's always going to because uh, you're, you're, as you're dragging the phonons, there can be a temperature dependent efficiency of drag, right? You could be starting to perfectly well start to see normal for electron phonon processes kicking in in a temperature dependent way. So I don't think you can rule that out. And if you were getting that, then you would get these deviations. And have you done these measurements on the electron irradiated samples? Uh, what happens when you're... We have done, yes, we've done some and 
basically speaking, uh, deviations that we see from, we haven't finished it, but deviations that we see from Matthiasen's rule are not going to be very big. Is that a fair statement, Philippa? Yeah. Basically speaking, when you first start eyeball it, you would say Matthiasen's rule is being obeyed. So you just shift it all right? Yeah. Yeah, it's not perfect. It's not absolutely perfect. But again, we, you have the data with you, right? I hope. So, you know, the best thing we can do is just show you guys the data. For higher temperatures, oh yeah. Um, I mean, what is the, um, what's the curve look like? Oh, okay. Yeah. There is no saturation in 150, right? <laughs> no, there is no saturation in 150, no. But, uh, but you wouldn't expect there to be. The umclap stuff, the umclap stuff is about an efficiency of momentum relaxation because of a scattering process, right? It's just like an alpha that you put on in front of your scattering process of how well is it relaxing momentum. A, you know, a, fun, a, a coefficient. Your material is very clean. Yeah. The only two mechanisms we know for such a pair is Anderson localization or condo. And none of them, if you can rule out this is not something to do with magnetic impurities because of magnetoresistance and also thermal power, because the zipper coefficient in the case of condo should be high, then this is something unknown. So good. So I should say that um, my statements about thermal power are about published thermal power. There is, I mean, uh, Jean-Philippe Reed, who you probably know from, he's back with Louis now, he did some thermal power um, uh, where he would not agree with the conclusions that I'm drawing here, but I would like to see the thermal power done by a third group. Okay, so it's a uh, mechanic. 